traditions of the senior policy seminar, ARC, is to have um, a presentation from one of our flagship institutions leading up to the policy roundtable, which is now scheduled uh, at, at 1 p.m. So I'm uh, pleased to uh, invite uh, uh, for this one a presentation from the African Development Bank. As I mentioned to you, uh, this will end up becoming the first ever African stakeholder to uh, support our senior policy seminar. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Chidozi, who happens to be, by the way, another ARC alumnus. I think he was in my group, <laughs> group C. And then uh, Lahun, the chief economist of the uh, East African region, will be making the presentation. Yep. Thank you, Lemon. And good morning to everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And before we go on, I wish to appreciate our very senior colleagues from ADB who are here. Um, by the left is a person that used to be what we call second in command in the entire African Development Bank. That's Madam Franny. She's here with us. And then we also have a, a long time executive director who also served as advisor to our president. That's Governor Fundanga, who is here with us. And then our office, the position of chief economist, was really brought to line light by our own Kaskende, who is also here. And also, uh, will I say, a product of a long-time partner of AERC in different dimensions. So our presentation will be brief. The last one will run you through our regional integration program. And then given whatever time that is left, I can tell you what we do in terms of how you can get some cash from ADV. Thank you. I'll be very, very, very brief uh, for the sake of time. My name is Salam Tamasgar. I'm the Chief Regional Economist for the African Development Bank uh, based in uh, Nairobi. The purpose of the presentation is to give you a highlight of our regional integration strategy framework at a corporate level and also the regional integration strategy paper that we are preparing to operationalize uh, the bank-wide regional integration uh, framework into the Eastern African context. I will start with a brief about the regional context first. Um, Let me give you a, a brief background about the re regional uh, context. The regional uh, department based uh, in Nairobi covers about 13 countries, so it's different from the EAC. In addition to the EAC member countries, we have about seven countries. Uh, the East Africa uh, Regional uh, Bureau also covers a number of uh, diverse countries, uh, five landlocked countries and uh, coastal areas that are providing uh, access to sea for these uh, land of countries. We have also two island economies, Seychelles and Comoros, and we have also a number of about five of them uh, that are termed as uh, fragile and post-conflict countries. According to the latest AEO 2018 and the 2018 Eastern African, uh, African Economic Outlook that was just launched yesterday, uh, the Eastern Africa region uh, has actually performed very, very well compared to the other uh, sub-regions in uh, the continent. Um, it has posted a higher GDP growth of 5.9 in 2017. Uh, the high growth rate was expected to continue also over the next uh, year or two. Uh, six countries in the region are the ones that are driving the, 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 the growth uh, performance. Uh, and in the supply side, uh, growth has been uh, driven by agriculture and industry. Uh, and on the demand side, growth has been driven by household consumption and public infrastructure. Over the next one year or two, Djibouti, Rwanda, and Kenya are expected to lead growth, uh, while in the 2017, the six countries that I mentioned uh, have actually led the growth performance. In terms of regional integration, intra-regional trade is uh, estimated at around 20% uh, in Eastern Africa which is higher by any standard than the other uh, uh, regional blocks in the region. 
The East African community is also ranked as the most integrated regional uh, block in the uh, continent. That are, out of the eight ones that are recognized by the African uh, Union, according to the African Integration Index uh, produced by the African Union, uh, ADB, and uh, UNECA. Uh, indeed, some countries in the region uh, also actually have the fellow EAC partner states uh, constitute their uh, export destination. For example, for Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda are among its top uh, export destinations at positions three, seven, and nine. So uh, for Rwanda, EAC partner states of Kenya, Burundi, and Tanzania are among its top export destinations at positions two, five, and eight respectively, which means uh, Burundi is the second uh, most important destination for Rwandan export, and uh, Tanzania and uh, uh, Kenya also uh, are among the top ten. However, Intra-regional trade in the EAC has not shown already steady growth, and if compared to the other regional blocks outside Africa, it is very, very low. For example, the 20% compared to the 16% intra-EU trade, and uh, more than 35% for the uh, intra-East Asia trade. So, this begs the question, what will it take for Eastern Africa to push its trade values and intra-regional trade beyond the current levels. And that's what we uh, are trying to achieve in the uh, current regional integration strategy paper. Uh, we also identified main challenges. According to the African Economic Outlook, there is low structural transformation, low levels of uh, labor productivity, high uh, uh, and inefficient in uh, resource use and uh, domestic resource gaps and fragility, as I said, seven out of the 13 Eastern African uh, regional member countries uh, are uh, termed as post-conflict or fragile states. And geography, in terms of geography, what I mean is five of the 13 Eastern African regional member countries are uh, landlocked, experiencing challenges related to access to sea and imports for exporters. So we have a diverse group of countries in, uh, in the region. Poverty and inequality are also high. I don't have to go through all this. Um, but there are also opportunities. One of the opportunities on the way forward, uh, which is of global nature, is the upturn in commodity prices and the positive FDI uh, outlook. While within the region, there are also a number of opportunities, including the stable public infrastructure spending, um, the mineral oil and natural gas discoveries in the Eastern Africa, the recovery from the 27 uh, drought and strong domestic demand from the emerging uh, middle class. We have also other opportunities in terms of regional integration via the EAC and COMESA, the tripartite arrangement, which has been signed in 2015, with the potential for improved intra-regional trade. However, we, the African Development Bank has taken regional integration seriously as part of its, its way forward. And then we have done a regional integration strategy paper. We just completed and we have done a completion report for it. And I just would like to take you through some of the key lessons. Some of the key lessons that are based on our completion report and the regional integration strategy paper and the evaluation by the independent, independent evalu <coughs> evaluation of the bank include the bank has considerable strength in financing hard infrastructure. But we found out that to, hire, to have a higher impact, we need to complement it with investment in soft in infrastructure, which is in line with what we discussed yesterday. Multiple RECs membership continues to be a, a major challenge, and access to markets and recurring mandatory trade barriers are also among the major challenges that are preventing uh, regional integration from going forward. We have also key soft governance challenges such as poor uh, trade facilitation and uh, legal and regulatory frameworks that are not uh, clearly defined and very strong. We also found out that infrastructure is critical for sustainable growth and inclusive development in the African context. However, however over the last few years, Fixed capital formation, which is a proxy for physical infrastructure, has not been growing sufficiently. So there is a 
the infra infrastructure financing gap that should be completed. So with all this, the bank approved a regional integration strategy framework last week with three major pillars. First one is power and infrastructure uh, investment, support to trade and investment, and the third one is financial integration. Now, this is the corporate level regional integration strategy framework which we wanted to operationalize for the region. In preparing our regional integration strategy paper based on the regional integration strategy framework at the corporate level, we have some selective uh, selectivity criteria where we wanted to first align it with the bank level strategy, but we also wanted to align it with, with the uh, regional integration and industrialization strategies of the relevant regional economic communities. We also wanted to incorporate the lessons learned to date and also inputs from uh, stakeholders, including uh, you from, uh, from the, on the discussion we're going to have uh, today. So this is, I think, a very golden opportunity for us to take your views. So the other arching objective of the regional integration strategy paper is to foster an integrated and diversified Eastern Africa region, which is capable of generating sustained in and inclusive growth. And we are identifying three major pillars. First one is what we call it thematic support area one, which is supporting regional infrastructure development, specifically focusing on energy, road, and ICT, as well as water and uh, uh, sanitation infrastructure. Second one is thematic support area two, which is strengthening the policy and institutional uh, framework for trade and investment, as well as industrialization. And a third pillar, which we actually do not call it pillar here, it's more of a uh, cross-cutting uh, foundation in financial sector integration, which includes uh, support to enhance uh, uh, access to finance, the financial inclusion and technological support for uh, innovative uh, financial sector and financial uh, integration among, among the uh, different financial uh, institutions. So we also wanted to make sure that bank support from the private sector window will complement the public sector window. In the three pillars, we also wanted to support regional member countries and institutions through the promotion of public-private partnerships because we said that infrastructure gap and infrastructure financing gap uh, as well as services are uh, very huge and this cannot be uh, completely covered by public investment. Uh, so there is a need for enhancing public-private partnership and uh, looking at other alternative financing uh, mechanisms. So under uh, this private sector window, the bank also uh, will uh, support technology and skills transfer development, entrepreneurship, research and development, and assist in establishing business uh, uh, corridors. So I think the main point is in, as the area of, as area of dialogue, we would like to uh, make sure that there is a coherence between regional and national operations. Elimination of non-tariff trade barriers are among the major issues to be, to be covered, and improving the regional uh, operations portfolio performance. And we also would like to dialogue to ensure uh, progress on the negotiations of the tripartite with the private sector, with civil society, and all other stakeholders. So what are the takeaways from the last two days for our regional integration strategy paper, today and yesterday? The two pillars, in my view, are very much in line with the discussions directly and the third pillar uh, implicitly. I think there is a need to ensure coherence between national and regional uh, priorities, uh, capacity development, um, and also policy harmonization for effective uh, natural resource management and value addition are important ingredients to enhance uh, uh, regional uh, integration. So, the final point that I would like to make is now based on this quick presentation, I would like to get your thoughts on the proposed pillars, the three pillars that are 
uh, whether they are in line with your thinking, uh, whether they are also uh, priorities in, in your area of uh, expertise. These are, again, uh, investment on regional uh, infrastructure, uh, support to trade and investment, and financial uh, sector integration. Uh, whether the new uh, preparation criteria is also in line with your uh, thinking, and what are the potential uh, areas of collaboration and support proposed to enhance implementation of regional integration in the region. And we'd like to know whether we are learning the right lessons uh, so far, uh, based on the discussions uh, we had yesterday and uh, today. And also, overall, we'd like to get your uh, feedback and thoughts and lessons in the area of regional integration as a senior policy makers in, in the continent and in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Dilan. So you have presented your um, East African regional integration strategy, and then you concluded with two pillars, and you want input. Maybe, uh, Shidori, can you kind of follow up on his presentation then before we open up? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I understand that time is limited, so I have a full-fledged PowerPoint, but I may not run through it, um, systematic. I'll just summarize a few points, especially as it relates to our operations um, and how it uh, links up with what we are doing, either at the regional integration level or at the national level. But one thing I need to say is that um, regional integration is at the core of our business. We support it, we appreciate it, and uh, indeed, we try to go the extra mile of giving countries incentives to finance regional integration projects. For instance, um, the way we work in ADB, we have three broad windows, three sources of our funding. One is the core ADB, which is more of a, a market-based financing. Um, the second one is ADF, African Development Fund, which is a soft window where you can borrow uh, almost free. So the other one is the Nigeria Plus Fund, which is available for countries to also finance projects. What we do is that every period of three years when we do a strategy, whether a regional strategy like the one he's doing, or strategy for each country, then we define the envelope available for that country for, for operations. In addition, we then do say that if any country chooses to use part of the money in this envelope to finance a project that is on regional integration, then we go the extra mile of matching it. In other words, you put 10 million on regional integration, not from your money, from the ADB money pre-allocated for you, your country. You now say out of it, $10 million for regional integration project. We bring another $10 million to match it, just to show you how much we support regional integration. Now, one point I need to make here again, like we pointed out uh, yesterday, is that countries, the money we allocate to countries is based on the performance of that country, which is derived from what we call country portfolio and institutional assessment, to see how good you are at managing both our portfolio and reforms. And within that context, regional integration is singled out as one strong element, such that any country that is moving forward in terms of implementing policies agreed within the regional integration body, like COMESA or ECOWAS or SADC, then that country is perceived to be scoring high on that. So the point here I wish to emphasize is that when a country has agreed to be a member of a regional integration body, like say COMESA, and, and within COMESA they have also agreed say, okay, come on a standard tariff. Then, if you pull back as an individual country, having not acceded to it, then the perception is that you are, you are not playing along with others and you are being penalized on the CPIA. So, which relates to the issue I was saying, um, if we know you don't want to get there, why do you agree to go there? So, if we are committed to go to any length of regional integration, then we should get there. Otherwise, let's not bite more than we can chew. Um, so that we don't penalize ourselves. Um, having said that, in terms of regional integration projects, what we finance 
and mainly infrastructure projects. Road, electricity, because some countries, especially in East Africa now, are exporting electricity, which is good. When you overproduce, you export. So the way it goes is that even though it is called regional integration projects, it's not the regional integration bodies that borrow money from us. Um, it is the individual government who still borrow money to finance up to the end of their own share uh, of the assets. If it's a road project, you borrow up to the cost of financing it to your border. The other country borrows to the same border, and probably you share the cost of financing the common, common border. So the liability is still on individual countries in terms of regional integration. Um, so, so to say that uh, it's not the regional integration bodies that really have to drive this process. If individual countries are not committed, uh, we are not going to be making much progress. Having said that on operation, in brief, on the side of knowledge where I really work now, I used to be in Tanzania and operations at the head office. So we have a few knowledge products, one of which is research. In fact, I was asking Chris just a few minutes ago, how come we not be hearing much of him? Because Chris Adams is an African <laughs> by all content. So he just told me that he, he's part of the current, uh, yeah, he's part of the current uh, um, AE of which we are doing. So we also support 10 tanks, one of which is AERC. And uh, Lema has mentioned in the morning about it. So we don't have the capacity to go and manage individual programs in the 54 African countries. So what we do is to take up eligible, strong think tanks and support for implementation. And not just AELC or ACBF, where we have big operations. Individual national think tanks represented here, depending on the nature of programs or projects we have, we can also collaborate with you. And uh, interestingly also, let, let me mention my division is in charge of the DB library, where we are strongly promoting um, e-knowledge um, virtual knowledge such that we will find a way to link up both through the regional integration bodies and to national bodies that uh, have got to do with knowledge uh, management. And finally, one thing we do strongly is capacity building in terms of project implementation. So if you happen to be in any of these organizations that have our projects, whether Comesa or SADEC or ECOWAS, then we wish to, and we want to support you in terms of the capacity of those managing those our projects. So um, if any is here and wants us to discuss about it, fine after this. But that's one thing we do strongly, both at national level and then at regional integration level to support anybody that is involved in implementing regional integration body to ensure that we realize the objectives in Africa. Thank you. As you can see for this session, there is no external chair. So I'm going to uh, take over and then uh, follow through the same uh, uh, procedure starting. We're going to open up for questions and audience participation. Uh, so AFDB, as you know, is one of our flagship uh, institutions. We have uh, two individuals, one from the head office, another one from the regional. And they have regional integration strategy and also, I guess, Africa-wide <laughs> integration strategy, both in knowledge and also capacity building. So now you have a chance uh, to actually uh, put them on, on trial, you know? So let's think of this as a jury, an African jury, including senior policy makers. Um, and um, it doesn't have to be questions. You can actually make commenters. And, and uh, so why don't we uh, begin with this um, section? Any, any questions? Comments? Yes, Emmanuel. Sorry. Since nobody else is asking questions, I'll, I'll, I'll ask mine. Now, I was interested that when you talk about East Africa, you're talking not about the EAC and you're not talking about COMESA, but you're talking about your own definition of East Africa. You then said that you don't need to work through the regional organizations. So I was just wondering, is that an explicit choice? Or do you sometimes work through the organizations, or do you prefer to work outside the organizations? So that so there's a bit. What I want to know more about the relationship between your regional integration work and the organization, the regional organizations. And the second one, just related, is you said that actually so your infrastructure projects depend on member states taking a share of the burden. And I wonder, just in terms of project pipeline, yesterday we talked about 
national interest not always actually being towards the regional, the regional goal. So I just wondered, do you have a lot of demand from group, sort of pairs of countries coming requesting support to build these cross-border infrastructure, or is that something that you're actually having to sort of promote and try and encourage? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sandet. My, uh, my name is Emmanuel Upe. I'm a minister in the Nigerian High Commission here in Kampala. I, I want to, the presenter, the last presenter, to throw more light because I don't think when the, many people are aware of the three portfolios through which the African Development Bank supports and sponsors projects among the member countries. The issue of Nigerian Trust Fund. I don't know how many of our members in the continent know that Nigeria is playing this kind of uh, role of adding a third portfolio for sponsoring, which is Nigerian Government Fund, the Nigerian Trust Fund. If we could throw more light on that so that this audience will benefit from it. Thank you. Okay, anyone on this session again? So I will move to the middle. Yes, Ambassador. Hello, yes. My, my question, there are two questions. The first one is, how do you evaluate the progress in terms of regional integration? Because at the level of the bank, how do you evaluate the progress in terms of regional integration in Africa? And the second thing would, which is related is, do you have any products which are biased, you know, the product that you are selling, which are biased in terms of regional integration? Because I know you have individual countries coming to you and then you've got, you know, what uh, should you develop these types of products that would really promote regional integration, which are biased towards regional integration in Africa? Thank you. Okay, anyone else on the... Yes, uh, uh, Louis. Yeah, um, thanks, Lemma. And uh, I thank the, the two presenters of uh, this strategy. Uh, my interest is on uh, PPPs, uh, public-private partnerships. We looked at them in the mid, uh, in 2005, 6, 7, as a potential source of financing of regional uh, projects. I would like them to share the experience of AFDB in PPPs. And the reason I'm raising this is that uh, in a number of uh, countries, the private sector is seeking several guarantees from government that when you fully analyze the proposal, you are actually looking at uh, a public uh, project. Uh, there are guarantees on uh, any default, guarantees on demand, guarantees on repair, but everything is guaranteed by, by government. So the risk sharing that one sees in PPPs does not, is not in sync with what we had originally, that this will be a, a critical source of financing for, for regional projects. Okay, um, thank you, please. Also, I'll introduce. I'm Bubakar from Mali. I really appreciate the support of the African Development Bank to the strong think tank. I don't know what do we mean by strong think tank. But uh, please allow me to invite the African Development Bank to support mainly in fragile countries, strategic studies group. It will be a very good thing. 
Uh, particularly in these countries, the governments are experiencing many financial difficulties. So the support of African Development Bank is welcome. Thank you so much. Oui, euh, bonjour, moi je suis Dr Ella Gigui. Je, je viens du Sénégal et je suis enseignant-chercheur au niveau du CESAC. Alors, euh, tout à l'heure, euh, au regard des interventions, surtout l'intervention de la Banque africaine de développement, une question a émergé tout à l'heure sur l'évaluation du processus d'intégration. Je reviens sur euh, effectivement l'intérêt de cette évaluation. Pour la simple raison, dans les discussions depuis hier, on n'a pas su comprendre les effets de cette intervention, de ces, de ces intégrations sur la population bénéficiaire. Parce qu'en réalité, l'intégration bénéficie qui Effectivement, nous parlons du développement, mais les bénéficiaires en tant que tels, est-ce qu'ils sont impliqués dans la prise de décision de l'intégration Et là, je voudrais savoir, à votre niveau, au niveau de, de la Banque africaine de développement, les évaluations qui sont faites, est-ce qu'il y a une intégration dans ces évaluations, les populations bénéficiaires de cette intégration Merci. Euh, je m'appelle Ahmad Akili, euh, de Mauritanie, Action pour l'éducation et le développement. Euh, ma question s'adresse au dernier orateur, orateur euh, surtout en matière de, de, de renforcement des capacités. Je voudrais savoir euh, à quel niveau se situe euh, l'action de la BAD au niveau de, de la coopération universitaire en Afrique. Euh, C'est là où peut-être qu'on pourrait agir euh, pour transformer la future élite africaine. À quel niveau euh, se situe l'appui de la BAD à, à, au, au, au milieu universitaire. Je vous remercie. Ok, on the last section. Uh, Fanny, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and I want to congratulate my uh, brothers from the African Development Bank for their presentation, and perhaps use this opportunity with my other hats to speak about one entity that the bank is supporting, which is a regional bank, the Trade and Development Bank, and to use this as, a, as a, an opportunity to ask a question so you can explain to the participants how this leveraging takes place. So, I'm a special advisor to the president of the Trade and Development Bank, and it's a bank that serves the Comesa countries. It's a purely commercial bank owned by member states and others, including the pension funds across Africa. Uh, the governors of central banks in Africa have put money into the bank. And it shows a good opportunity how the African Development Bank pushes regional integration initiatives. Uh, the African Development Bank is a shareholder in the Trade and Development Bank, so it's holding a commercial uh, uh, support into that entity, but also works in parallel when countries identify regional integration projects, uh, blending its finance with the finance of the Trade and Development Bank and crowding in other investments. But the third area is through ancillary support in policy work and capacity building. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to um, ask uh, our Dr. Chido and uh, Tilahun to explain how the bank does this in other regions uh, and what are the opportunities in the new strategy, particularly around uh, supporting uh, the uh, industrial and SME clusters, the uh, agribusinesses and industrial parks that are serving broader regions under, under Pillar 2. And then the second uh, part I wanted to uh, also share is on the PPP uh, side, because through the Trade and Development Bank, for example, we support investments in countries 
that uh, uh, are guaranteed through private insurance. So it's really leveraging the private financial markets uh, to support beyond just the, the, the commercial funding, but also through the insurance industries, through the guarantee industry, and perhaps even more interesting through the local currency and domestic capital markets. So this whole financial sector pillar that you presented as an opportunity for regional integration, given that many of the people in this uh, seminar are coming from central banks, from ministries of finance and planning, if you could explain more how your strategy is going to go into support through the financial sector pillar beyond the traditional sort of direct financing uh, instruments that the bank has. Thank you. I just, I'll just take one question and then, then we have to get back to our uh, presenters. We only have uh, 10 minutes left. So one, uh, anyone who has a burning desire to ask a question or make a comment, Okay, please. Merci, professeur Lema, de me passer la parole. Je m'appelle Faisal Abdoulaye du Cameroun. Je suis en charge de la politique fiscale au ministère des Finances. Alors, je voudrais euh, partager une, une interrogation notamment sur euh, l'apport de la fiscalité ou plus précisément de l'harmonisation fiscale dans le processus d'intégration, notamment dans la région de l'Afrique de, de l'Est. L'expérience de cette région a été présentée comme relevant des bonnes pratiques. Quel rôle a pu jouer dans l'approfondissement de l'intégration dans cette région-là Quel rôle a pu jouer la fiscalité Est-ce qu'aujourd'hui, les législations fiscales des États membres de cette sous-région ont été euh, harmonisé parce que euh, revenant un peu à l'expérience de l'Afrique centrale nous avons pu déjà harmoniser les législations en matière d'impôts sur les revenus, en matière euh, de taxes sur la valeur ajoutée des droits d'accise mais nous avons le sentiment que cette harmonisation n'a pas accéléré le processus d'intégration au niveau de la sous-région euh, Afrique centrale quelle est donc l'expérience en Afrique de l'Est est-ce que la fiscalité a joué un rôle essentiel dans uh, l'intégration uh, économique dans cette sous-région. Merci. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll now come back to the presenters. I think a lot of these questions were addressed to the headquarters. So, Chidozi, uh, you are on the hot seat. Uh, so, you don't really have to answer all the questions. You group them into maybe one, two, two or three, and then respond. And uh, uh, we need to be brief because uh, we're running a little bit late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, starting from um, brief, nothing manual, please. Uh, the issue in terms of the relationship, let me clarify it. Um, if a project is a national project, every nation can come to ADB borrow a project for a project and finance it. Now, when it's a regional integration project, it means it involves more than one country. So, the certain point is often a regional integration body is on the driving seat to relate with ADB, less with the countries involved, and so that it becomes kind of one project. But, in terms of since what we give is actually loan, and the actual signing of the loan and, and the liability goes to individual countries to the extent of their own share of the project. So the regional integration body is needed to drive it and to relate with us. But individual countries will bear the liabilities because a uh, commissioner, for instance, cannot come and borrow. It's not a legal entity to that extent. Um, so that's actually the relationship. And. Uh, my brother from Nigeria, um, Honorable Minister, as I mentioned briefly, yes, most people know about ADB and then ADF. Some don't even know of ADF uh, because it's our internal air business. Um, the one we call NTF, Nigeria Trust Fund, like you say, we are three, three arms through which you can come and borrow. And then because you can come and they tell you there's no, no more funds for you. So NTF is the one in Nigeria 
give to Africa. Say this fund is available to any country that needs it to finance a project. You borrow and pay back at just a minimal interest. So it's a third window through which projects are financing. And uh, I believe most ministers of finance know about it. But for those who don't know, um, they could look forward to it to finance the operations. And um, I think it's we talk on this evaluation side of our business. Um, and, um, and in terms of uh, what Ambassador Janki was asking us, so do we have preferred areas that fly very fast, bias areas? Um, presently, ADB seems to be biased in terms of what we call high five. In other words, five areas to distinguish our operations. One is the energy. Um, two is, uh, not in any other, um, agriculture. So we're talking about Feed Africa. Then three, industrialization. Um, four, improving the quality of life, and then five, regional integration. So any project that fits into regional integration. So if you are talking in terms of being biased, yes, any project that falls within this context is our preference, and we run with it. Dr. Um, um. <laughs> Kasekende, on the issue of PDP, uh, PPP, of course, you know as much as we do on ADP. One thing I need to add, add is that one product we have now which seems to facilitate these processes is a guarantee, credit guarantee. So we deliver it now as a full-fledged product. So if there's any, any project, even if we are not financing, we can come in there and provide a guarantee for that project, such that if it fails, then to the center of our guarantee, whether it's partial guarantee, then uh, we take it up. So that's one way that this PPP can be pushed forward. And uh, we may not have had so much experience in terms of some of these directs. Um, there will be just a few. Um, but guarantee is one way uh, to encourage those who are financing it um, to be sure that the risk is reduced by investing in Africa on that note. And uh, probably plan we also <laughs> do this issue of fr fragile contents, whether we have, have anything to do with it. Um, our brother Amadou, um, on universities, uh, of course, improving the quality of life has to do with uh, education. Um, financing universities, one, most universities in Africa, unfortunately, yes, unfortunately, are owned by government. I remember I had engaged Lema with a discussion on this as this AERC, we are not seeing uh, presence of private universities. Um, any of us that wants to go to America for university, where you count, Starting with the so-called Ivy League, we count all of them. They are private universities. So, for a private university, we can give you a loan to do what, to develop the university. We're already doing a few. We finance that. And for public one, uh, that means you have to go through government because you are not a legal entity to come and borrow from us. Um, but in terms of capacity building, most often we can't deal with other universities in Africa. So we use AERC, African Capacity Building Foundation and other things can to reach out to you. That's the way we operate. Um, and our friend, um on SMEs in terms of what we do and so on, I think it's still, it hasn't much changed from, um, from the way you left it. Uh, but what we do increasingly is this issue of online, on lending. There are so many banks, financial institutions in Africa. So what we still do, you on lend to them, to now on lend to SMEs, to industrial clusters. Um, and I know there's much interest in industrial clusters from the suppliers of funds. I know our present bank is very eager on it, but often you see that the policy element from the national governments to really uh, bring it to the platform of receiving them is not strong, is not there. So that is one area um, we're willing, especially now if it has to do with agriculture and whatever. I mean, we'll be glad to finance it directly. Um, I think I will stop here, and my colleague yeah, will you, cover the rest. Yes. Yeah, I think that's very. I, I'm going to just ask one question. Uh, that's one. I think it, it came from Bruce, uh, otherwise known as Emmanuel. <laughs> okay, we've been talking. Anyway, so I, I think uh, you, you implied that um, you have this East African integration strategy, uh, and uh, there's no overlap between like ESC, you know, the integration type states, and your definition of East African region for AFDB. 
And then when you say that, I think it's broader number, right? But you're not talking about integration in those uh, broader category of countries. Or are you talking about like, uh, integration in, in general in East Africa? Is that for the entire set of countries in the administrative region of East Africa for AFDFWB? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. Actually, let me start by, by uh, saying a few words on what you just mentioned. Um, basically, the 13 African countries that are covered by the regional uh, office in Nairobi uh, are basically for administrative purposes, and that's basically we are thinking, when we think about regional integration strategy for the region, we are thinking of this diverse group of people. That's why earlier I mentioned that this is a region which is composed of diverse group of countries, uh, where some of them are fragile, some of them are uh, island states, and some of them are landlocked. So we wanted to have a strategy which actually will look at the specific needs of each of these countries and address their concern. For landlocked countries, for example, the support that we try to provide will be enhancing infrastructure connectivity with the uh, coastal areas. For uh, island states, we wanted to uh, facilitate their connection with the mainland um, uh, uh, Africa region. And so basically, uh, we will look at the specific needs in e of each member country in the region. But when we do that, when we do that, we'll have a two-pronged approach. We will deal with national governments in selection of national uh, projects that will have a regional implication, for example. We also will be working with the uh, regional economic communities, for example, with the EAC, with uh, COMESA, and of course, with, in general, with the tripartite. For example, earlier we had a capacity building pillar in the previous regional integration strategy paper, and basically in that one, we were working with the COMESA as the, uh, as the project implementation unit. So that's, 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 that's the, the idea. Uh, I think, let me also add with what Chidozi said in responding to uh, uh, Franny's uh, uh, questions. In the third pillar, in the third pillar, basically the support is to look at uh, cross-cutting foundation, which includes investing in hard and soft infrastructure that will enhance financial sector development and efficiency of the financial sector to mobilize savings into investment in regional uh, uh, integration uh, projects. Uh, the support will also include uh, infrastructure uh, development for payment systems. For example, we have a project that is being implemented by the East African community, which looks at in enhancing the infrastructure of uh, the payment systems and, of course, the related policy areas. Uh, our support also will include to, to support the financial institutions directly through a private sector window, for example, through the, the lines of credit to banks that will be only lent to uh, enhance investment in, in, in infrastructure. And, of course, PPP also is considered as one potential uh, option and we're also thinking of mobilizing uh, non-traditional uh, uh, financial resources into investment in, in infrastructure, again, through uh, PPPs. Um, in terms of PPPs, the bank is now supporting uh, uh, a number of countries through capacity building for the PPP uh, nitty-gritty, basically. First, we did an assessment of the needs and gaps in legal, regulatory, and national uh, frameworks, and we designed some training, sometimes one week, two weeks trainings for PPP practitioners and take them through the whole cycle of uh, a PPP uh, project. Um, one, well, one question that was asked about the, uh, uh, the uh, evaluation of uh, regional integration. Uh, Basically, uh, as I said earlier, we had a regional integration strategy framework that was completed in 2016, and we have an independent evaluation department which, it, who, who, which did the assessment based on a number of criteria, such as relevance of the regional integration strategy to support countries, and whether uh, there has been an impact, and so on and so forth. And the, one of the key findings was that, yes, out of the two prior uh, uh, pillars, which is infrastructure, regional infrastructure, and capacity building. The assessment found out that the bank has done quite a remarkable job in its investment in hard infrastructure, 
However, it was also told that to have a better impact and higher impact on the ground, those hard infrastructure investments should have been accompanied by soft infrastructure. And on the way forward, each and every hard infrastructure will be basically accompanied or complemented by soft infrastructure issues, such as uh, pay facilitation and, and so on and so forth, one-stop border posts uh, and so on. But however, the other thing on the second pillar, which is capacity building, compared to the demand, both at the regional economic communities and national uh, authorities level, uh, we have not really done that much. Not because the bank hasn't done much, but because the demand and the gap has been so high. So that lesson is also taken into account in the development of the new regional integration uh, strategy paper. Uh, and also in terms of, uh, again, in terms of measuring, uh, okay, so in terms of also measuring the, uh, the um, impact of regional integration, I was referring to the African Regional Integration Index that is being prepared every year, which compares the different regional economic communities and the blocks, uh, which looks at financial integration, which looks at uh, infrastructure uh, integration and uh, trade integration. And then there's also a composite index for each, for each regional block, where uh, the last uh, report has found that East African uh, community has been uh, the major and most integrated regional block in, in the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Shidoji uh, Slaoun, a very informative uh, presentation. A show of hands for the AFDB uh, team. Um, but I thought that uh, there were a couple of things that came up which were relevant to ARC, and uh, I'm going to weigh in. Uh, one has to do with uh, universities. Uh, the second has to do with fourth country, five-year states. And the third is Nigeria uh, Trust Fund. And I'm going to start with Nigeria Trust Fund. And ARC has been a beneficiary of Nigeria Trust Fund. And in fact, uh, they are the first ones, again from Africa, which actually funded exchange fellows programs. So we have now ARC researchers actually spending time interacting with uh, policy makers, by the way, producing papers of quality. And we are very pleased about that. And also, since I'm on Nigeria, Nigeria has been um, with us and one of the largest beneficiaries, also size. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, some of our alumni have, in fact, transformed the banking industry. You know, Charles Saludo and then Chidozi, you know. So, so there's a huge ARC footprint in, in, in Nigeria. Um, I think the second is on, um, on uh, yeah, universities. See, one thing that um, people do not quite appreciate is that ARC is not just a simple think tank. You know, it's not it's really kind of, it's growing into something so hybrid, uh, integrating knowledge, research, policy outreach, capacity building, network, it's all, and, then, and then graduate training over 40 universities. It's a very difficult organization to explain. It, there's nothing like ARC on this globe, nothing. Okay. And this is actually our biggest uh, comparative advantage and our biggest challenge is how do we uh, communicate that. And a number of institutions, including ABB, use ARC to reach out to the rest of uh, the region. By the way, we have been tweeting on this. I saw some interesting tweet uh, uh, yesterday. It has to do with uh, success stories. What are the regional success stories in Africa? Somebody said ARC is an African regional integration. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a classic. On, uh, that's why in, in the case of universities, since we have three uh, collaborative uh, degree program, masters, PhD, when, a when ADB supports Fragile and post-conflict space, both in knowledge generation and universities, are actually doing dual. Okay, in, in the current, so you are not, you may not be doing this directly. You are actually doing it, uh, and, and it's been very, very useful. I think with this, I'm going to uh, fragile, fragile. I think, uh, in fact, the, the current uh, project, which is by the way the largest uh, ever to ARC, and we're very pleased about this, he focuses heavily on fragile and post-conflict space, and in capacity building, and training, and also research. Um, and then, of course, university. There are universities embedded there. So, um, and I didn't even know that ADB was supporting TDB. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's another, uh, yeah. And then TDB is also supporting ARC. <laughs> TDB is also a founding a member of the governance forum. By the way, also Nigeria. 
Nigeria is among the 12 central banks very happy about that. I think we are going to end uh, this uh, session with this and then we'll go for lunch. We'll come back at 1 p.m. for the private public uh, policy roundtable. So maybe, like, I think uh, the previous chairs always said we should have a show of hands for the audience, right? So we'll do that and then we'll leave. Okay? Any announcements for? Yeah.